but you know what time it is. It's time for more stories, fables, and ghostly tales. Before I jump right into it and stick my teeth into this topic, I wanted to plug this show quickly. Join up with other tale tellers using this Twitter handle, at StoriesFablesGT. Hop onto our YouTube channel that gets updated every single weekend, and visit me on the Facebook page in the links to this episode. And, so I know you guys are into this, like and sub so I know what you like, so I can produce more content that's more in line for what you guys want. Okay, today's episode is all about vampires. Nope, not the ones that sparkle in daylight, the ones that you throw pumpkin seeds out to keep them counting. You didn't know? Well, that's what I'm here for. I'm going to bring to you a not-so-common understanding and unique knowledge base for what vampires are. Used to be their strengths, weaknesses, and unique aspects about them that you wouldn't normally hear about. So, listen well, tale tellers. This is going to get good. For those of you who are unaware of what vampires are, don't stress. You're about to find out. The generic universal vampire is an eternal immortal being that lives in constant darkness, needs blood, and are unable to stand sunlight. Oh, and are forever damned. That is about as broad as I can get. But we'll get into the details shortly. So first things first, where do they come from? There are so many places and different derivatives of vampires that picking one would really do an injustice to the whole dichotomy of vampires. I mean, it's like describing an apple and picking pink ladies as your only apple and stopping right there. There are vampires from all different parts of the world. Norway, Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. All of them have their own slice of that vampire pie. Let's take a quick look at some of the more uncommon vampires and where they're from. So I'll, I'll rattle a couple off. Uh, Mesopotamia, called uh, Lamatsu. She Who Erases is her nickname. Edimu, um, also known as Ikimu, and has details and records dating back as far as 6,000 years ago. I think we're going to cover that briefly as well. With earliest records being 6,000 years ago, which we'll cover later in this episode. Jewish origins, Lilith. Spanish, Mexican, Puerto Rico, Americas, El Chupacabre, the goat sucker. Greek mythology, the very, very first vampire. Now this, this will have a bit of controversy around it, but again, I'll cover this later in the episode. But the name is Ambrogio. Southeast Asia, uh, Bahuta or Pret, China, China, Jiangxi, Malaysian, Penanglan, Indonesia, Layak, Africa, Ramanga, Norse, Drago, Albania, Sriga, Greece, this will be a tough one, <laughs> Viacolacus, anyone who knows how to pronounce that, let me know, American or Western vampires, well, I mean, you know that, it's, uh, it's the vampire. But as I park those, I need to talk about one in particular, Ambrogio, who is clouded as the very first vampire, with over 6,000 years of history supporting that claim. Now, I have used multiple sources here, I mean many, to make sure that I've picked the right one. Uh, everyone's got their favorite, so forgive me if this isn't the right one, but uh, we'll get to yours eventually, I'm sure. So the very first vampire story goes exactly like this. The curse, the moon, the blood will run. He could not sleep that night, and so stayed outside the temple trying to contemplate the meaning of the fortune. With the dawn, he realized he had not slept a wink, and as he walked back to town, he saw a beautiful woman dressed in robes of white walking towards the temple. He introduced himself, and she did the same. Her name was Selene, and was the maiden of the temple she tended to, and took care of her sister, the oracle, while she is in her trance-like state. The two would meet at the same time on the following days, and gradually fell in love. Ambrogio asked Celine to marry him, and to return with him to Italy, as it was his last day in Greece. She agreed, and he would go make the preparations and meet her at the same time next morning. This angered Apollo, as he took a liking to the lovely Celine. Apollo appeared to Ambrogio and cursed him. From that day forward, the mere touch of Apollo's sunlight would burn his skin. Distraught and not able to meet with Selene, Ambrosio ran towards a cave 
that led to Hades for protection from the sun. Hades, the god of the underworld, listened to the tale and made a deal with Hades. He would grant Ambrogio and Selene protection in the underworld if he would steal Artemis's silver bow. Hades gave an Ambrogio a Megil wooden bow with 11 arrows to hunt with, and he was to offer his trophies to Artemis to gain his favor. As collateral, Hades bade him to leave his soul until he returned to Hades. Should he return without the bow, he'd have to live in Hades' hell forever, never to be with Selene. Ambrosio had no way of contacting Selene. He did have a parchment, but with no instrument or ink to write with. With his bow and arrow, he killed a swan, using its feather as a pen and blood for ink. He wrote her a note that he could not meet with her, but would find a way for them to be together then left the note in their meeting place. Selene was devastated, but as not to anger Apollo, kept working at the temple. Again, no Ambrogio, but another parchment, this time a love poem. Ambrogio for 44 days before dawn would slay a swan and write Selene her letters and poems. Then after draining the bird, he'd offer the body to Artemis as tribute to the goddess of hunting, the moon and sister to Hades that she would be honoured by his tribute and would be able to convince Hades to remove the curse. Ambrogio had one arrow left on the 45th night and missed the swan to sacrifice to Artemis, as well as not having the blood or pen to write to Selene. Artemis, seeing as he was a good hunter and how dedicated he was, came down. Ambrogio begged Artemis to borrow her bow and an arrow to kill one more bird to leave one final note to his beloved. Taking pity on him, Artemis agreed to let him borrow the silver bow and arrow. Ambrogio had his chance and now ran in desperation to the cave that led to Hades. After realizing what had happened, Artemis cast down her own curse on Ambrogio, that causing all silver to burn his skin. With the bow in his hand, he dropped to the ground. Artemis was furious at the deceit, but as he begged for her forgiveness, he explained his love for Selene, Apollo's curse, and the deal with Hades. He swore and apologized profusely that he had no other choice. She took pity on him once more and decided to give him one more chance. She offered to bestow him these gifts. A great hunter, almost as good as she. Speed and strength of a god. Fangs which would drain the blood of any beast. And immortality. The only catch was that Artemis was a virgin goddess, and all her followers had to remain so and unmarried as well. They would never be able to touch again. No kissing, no children. Ambrogio agreed, being that they could live together forever. He left a note for Selene to meet him on the docks the next morning. Upon receiving the note, she ran away before Apollo could notice. When she got to the ship, in the hull lay a coffin with instructions to have the captain set sail and not to open the coffin until nightfall. The two lived in Ephesus, in a cave during the day and at night worshipped Artemis at her temple. The years went by and Selene aged while Ambrogio stayed young. She fell ill and was on her deathbed. Distraught he would never join? Distraught he would never join Selene in the afterlife. Distraught he would never join Selene in the afterlife. Ambrogio went to the woods and killed a swan for tribute, begging to make Selene immortal as well. Artemis appeared, thankful for his dedicated worship and made one last deal. She told him that he may touch Selene just once to drink her blood, that doing so would kill her mortal body, but from then on, her blood mixed with his and could create eternal life for any who drank it. Ambrogio explained to Selene what had transpired, and after much convincing, he bit her neck and took her blood into his body. Setting her limp body down, she started to radiate and levitate up toward the sky. Ambrogio watched helplessly as Selene's spirit met Artemis at the moon. Ambrogio watched helpless. Ambrogio watched helpless as Selene's spirit met Artemis at the moon. And when she arrived, the moon lit with a brilliant light. And with that, Selene became the goddess of moonlight. Every night, she would reach down with her rays to touch the earth, and of course, to reach out to her beloved and their vampire children. That is one intense story. So now that we know the original vampire origin, let's explore some hand-picked appearances, powers, and ways to stop vampires. 
focusing on some of the more common vampires in this episode, and just touching on them lightly. There will be plenty of episodes to delve deeper into each of these vampires and many, many others. So, now that we know one account of the original vampire origin, let's explore the appearances, powers, and ways to stop some examples of vampires from other countries. Let's explore their appearances, powers, and ways to stop them. I'm going to talk about a couple, not all of them obviously, just three, so I can give you an idea of what to expect. In later episodes, I'll cover many, many more. The first one on the list is Jiangxi, known as the Chinese Hopping Vampire. Their appearance is greenish to whitish skin with horrifying rotting flesh. As a side note, Jiang means hard or stiff. In fact, they are so stiff they can't move properly, which is why they hop around with arms outstretched to reach towards their prey. Their powers are indestructibility, they can't be harmed, and they absorb life force. I don't know about you, but that's, that's some pretty crazy powers right there. To protect against the Jiangxi, thread stained with a concoction of black ink, chicken blood, and a burnt talisman can be used to ward them off. Also, some more esoteric uh, tools of the trade to keep these guys away is blood of a black dog, stone masoned awl, an axe, a broom, holding your breath so they can't hear you, and a Taoist talisman stuck on the forehead to immobilize them. And while it's stuck on there, they can't do a thing. It's basically like imprisoning them on the spot. Our next vampire is the Norse Draugr, or otherwise named Revenants. They're undead warriors that feast on human blood and flesh depending on the type. Now there are countless stories, but they've been known to eat people in one bite. I'll explain. Their appearance is a mix between warriors, so Viking warriors, you know, muscle-bound, sinewy, undead warrior skeletons, and it also shifts to being cold, lifeless, sagging skin, often bloated or swollen. So there's quite a range, there's quite a range of um of depictions of, of how these Drogo look. Their powers? Quite unique. Beyond having superhuman strength, they can actually increase their size at will. The more powerful ones can get as large as a mountain. They're also immune to normal weapons. And here's a tidbit that you might not know. They can swim through solid stone. Swim. So like me or you jumping into a pool of water, they can jump into endless stone. That's just crazy. The best way to protect yourself from these creatures is not to fight them one on one. Is actually to prevent their ability to be risen. So what they would do, what the Norse people would do, is place iron scissors on the chest of the deceased and inside the coffin. And that would keep the Draga from raising. They also used to put straw or twigs inside the corpse's clothing to keep them from rising up again. They'd also push needles into the soles of their feet. And can you imagine if they, you know, you weren't dead? I mean, you'd, they'd know if you weren't dead, put simply. They'd also move the coffin into three different directions. So north, south, east, east, south, west, different combinations. And that would supposedly qualm the spirit and send them on their way. And lastly, the good old fashioned holy water, which seems to permeate across all different vampire types. Maybe not the Jiangxi, uh, like the, the Chinese vampires, but most often than not, vampires are stopped with holy water. The last one on our list is the Malaysian, okay, this is, I might butcher this one, <laughs> Penangalan. Any uh, Malaysian listeners out there, please correct me, write it in the comments, uh, embarrass me. Um, I gave it my best shot, okay, I gave it my best shot. Their appearance, a detached head with organs flailing around behind them. So they leave their body behind, so a hollow body, whilst it floats through the night. So their powers are to absorb the blood of pregnant women and absorb the life force of children. They use their long tongues to reach into different areas of houses and latch onto the body, absorbing all the blood. Those who do survive actually succumb to a wasting disease, which is only curable by a bomo, which is a shaman. Now you can protect yourself from these creatures. One way is to destroy it by preventing it from reaching its body. So you can trap it, you can uh, entangle it in roots or entangle it in vines, 
that's one way they've actually stopped them from both attacking and persisting. You can also place thorns on the entrance to your door to keep them away. Use a machete to, you guessed it, cut through organs. No surprise there. And here's a particular, <laughs> particularly interesting way to get rid of a penangalan. Fill the empty corpse with broken glass so that when it returns, it ruptures its organs. Pleasant. Really, that's, that's really pleasant. <laughs> My goodness. So, that's it for now. There's a lot to absorb in this episode, so I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, but I will continue this vampire dissection series, and I'll keep looking deeper into not only the mentioned vampires in this episode, but many more different creatures in the future. I'll actually make this into a series, and we can take each vampire type from a different country uh, and break them down. Find out what makes them tick, their history, and even down to that vampire I mentioned at the beginning, that if you drop pumpkin seeds, it has to pick each one up. And that one's a, a bonus bit of detail for you. So, like being bitten for the first time, and succumbing to your slumber, this is just the beginning. And to finish this off, join me on Twitter, and to finish this off, and to finish this off, join me on Twitter using the handle stories, fables, GT. Talk to me on Facebook. I'm getting lots more stories, a lot more feedback, which is fantastic. You can find me at stories, fables, ghostly tales. And I upload these stories almost every day. So sometimes it'll be every single day or every second day. Um, and there's more every weekend. So I'm blasting these out. And also leave a comment so I know you love the episode or that you're enjoying it. That's, that's why I'm doing it, to have a lot of fun. So stay safe. You might want to eat some garlic before you sleep tonight. Till next time, tell tellers. And here's a blooper reel. So stay safe. You might want to cover your house in holy water or drink some holy water. Hey, it's -a me, Ambrogio. Who are you, Amenada? I'll ask you a love letter. Thanks, that would drain the blood of any beast. I'm a vampire. I'm a vampire. He left another. Nah. This guy's just leaving notes everywhere. The two lived in Ephesus, in a cave. <clears throat> The two lived in Ephesus. Pla. The two lived in Ephesus. 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 Selene promptly lost her shit. Distraught, she would never join him in the afterlife. As Selene's spirit met. I don't know. I missed the swan. Artemis is gonna be pissed. <laughs>